We are at um, the beginning of the end of the journey. Since the middle of June, <coughs> we have been journeying through uh, New Testament letters. I don't know if you realize that that was a pattern we were doing, but we have been going through letters in the New Testament since the beginning of June. Um, slowly learning something from the history of Christians who have gone before and considering our story and the bigger picture of God's story as a whole. And today, we will be diving into our last letter of the season before we get to Advent and start preparing for the coming of Christmas. It's just around the corner. But through this series, we've become familiar with the letters of Paul. Um, we've learned from the mysterious author of Hebrews, and even have read some letters that the author is still up for debate. Um, in the midst of all of that, uh, we've experienced mystery and questions, but found the safety of um, dwelling in mystery, and how God can reveal great things to us about himself and about ourselves, even when we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. So today, um, we are diving into 2 Thessalonians um, and learning about um, Paul's connections with the church in Thessalonica. Now, like 1 and 2 Timothy that we dove into over the last couple weeks, um, Second Thessalonians, there's some debate about if Paul actually wrote it. Less of a debate as there was with um, the letters of Timothy. Um, but it's still present. Some people say that there are things in it, in this letter, that um, don't sound like Paul as a whole. Um, and that makes them question. Um, and some question details and dating and language and blah, blah, blah. But once again, we remember that even when there's uncertainty, and some scholar may have questions about something, he used some fancy word instead of the normal word that he would have probably used, we can dwell in the mystery of the author and still hear God's truth. We can hear in that um, unknown, maybe it was Paul, well, maybe it wasn't, but the point is God can still speak through God's word even if that detail was not made clear to us. Apparently God didn't need to check with me before he published his, his book. Weird. But Paul um, is the one that is claimed to be the author of 2 Thessalonians, and he, along with two companions, um, are writing this letter to these Christians in Thessalonica. Where in the world is that? Uh, well, I have a map. Um, you look at this map and you'll notice there's Italy over in the corner and Turkey over on the other side and in the middle is Greece, um, what is modern day Greece, and Thessalonica is near Philippi um, in modern day Greece. If Heather advances forward, it's a little bit bigger there for you. Um, so Thessalonica is located here. Because of its location near the Mediterranean Sea, it was a very diverse population of people, both class-wise and um, uh, heritage. Um, and so the church in Thessalonica was also diverse. Um, and it spoke volumes, the story of this church spoke volumes because their classes did not hold them back from loving each other. And that became a reputation for them. That though um, they were, some were going to be, you know, lawyers or Roman citizens and fancy things, and others are farmers or servants. They all gathered together and radiated love. <clears throat> and so today we're going to hear from Paul as he celebrates that characteristic in them, and hopefully we hear some source of hope for ourselves about these Christians from all those years ago. I encourage you to turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. This will be in the second half of your Bible. Um, if you hit Hebrews, you've gone too far, Hebrews, or even Revelation. You've 
go back a few pages. It's just before um, Timothy, um, where we were just diving in. So uh, we'll read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 and then hop down to 11 and 12 and read that all at once. But we will talk about the middle verses, just not right away, okay? From Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God our Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to all of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we must always thank God for you. This is only right because your faith is growing by leaps and bounds, and the love that all of you have for each other is increasing. That's why we ourselves are bragging about you in God's churches. We tell about your endurance and faithfulness in all the harassments and troubles that you have put up with. We are constantly praying for you for this, that our God will make you worthy of his calling and accomplish every good desire and faithful work by his power. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored by you and will be honored by him, consistent with the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul seems to start out here with a very classic opening. Um, with, hey, it's Paul, I've got some buddies with me. But he outpours this over flowing joy um, over this church. We have to thank God for you. We must thank God for you because of what he knows. There's a gut reaction as he hears about the Thessalonians of what he wants to do uh, in response to them. Their reputation of being faithful and loving is going forward. And as their faith grows, their capacity to love has been growing, as if those things are connected. The more you grow with Christ, the more your ability to love increases as well. And so Paul makes it clear that he's bragging about the Thessalonians and how they've been faithful even in the midst of persecution. Now the timing of this letter, we, we talked last week about this really cool guy named Emperor Nero. He's not a cool guy. He's a big jerk. Um, he's the one that ended up executing Paul, or telling people to execute Paul eventually. Um, he is the one, the emperor in reign while this letter is happening. And so as tensions are growing for Christians and rules about Christianity being illegal are growing, uh, persecution of them is growing. And uh, Paul is telling them to be faithful and how he sees them being faithful and how proud he is of them even though the tensions continue to grow. Good job. Keep going. And then he prays for them, wanting to caution them and encourage them and to protect them, asking that as they continue to be faithful to God's message, that he hopes that God's name is glorified and God honors them for their commitment to him. This is what um, the lectionary scheduled for our readings today, okay? So verses 1 through 4 and 11 and 12. And it just paints a beautiful, happy picture. Paul loves these guys. But if you take a second and you hop back to those passages and look at verses 5 through 10, there's this weird chunk in the middle where um, Paul, um, what, this is one of those questions of why people think it wasn't Paul um, that wrote this letter because um, he says that your suffering is what is earning you a place in heaven. Um, your persecution is leading to you securing your spot, like you are becoming holy. The people who always have it good are probably bad, and so they're going to burn later. Don't worry. Like, and, and so there's this weird, like, heavy language of, like, vengeance and uh, bitterness in there. In sandwiched in between this, like, loving message of, like, you guys rock. You're so good. Way to go. Keep it up. 
Also, like, there's a reason for your suffering. Let's explain it to you. Let's explain your pain. God's earning your spot for you. Like, you're, he's carving out your spot in the pew, you know. And when we look at Paul as a whole, and even God as a whole, we don't see that as the overall message of Scripture, and so there must be more happening there than what we understand. Um, but that passage over centuries was taken as an excuse to hurt people. Verses <laughs> 5 through 10 were used um, for centuries in multiple ways, and some to say that um, abused women should stay in abusive marriages because their suffering is an honoring thing to God and will lead to something holy in the end. Um, or that, you know, trying to explain the pain or loss that we've experienced and say, well, God needed an angel, you know, when in reality, like, God is full and complete on his own. He doesn't need us for anything that desires us. You guys did not lose your loved ones because God just felt like a needy toddler that wanted to like grab somebody else's toys. That's not why we have pain today. Our God is good. That doesn't fit a God that's good. And people, so people took that passage and mutilated it over time and hurt others with it over the centuries. But I still think we can hear truth here and learn something from the complexity of this opening letter, this opening portion of the letter. We see this problem of taking the, the letters of, the literal letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, of this letter too closely, but missing the essence of who God is and the bigger picture of scripture and the story God tells us. And I think it also depicts the struggle of what happens when we play the comparison game with others. Like, obviously, God loves me more because look at all this pain I'm in. So I'm super holy and good, and that person's not suffering at all, so they must be terrible. They're definitely reserving a cage for themselves in hell. This com comparison games don't, aren't helpful. We've talked about that before. And that passage can frequently, passage, verses 5 through 10 can frequently develop that attitude in us or justify that when we take it out of context. Instead, we see as a whole a message of hope and a message of encouragement to a group of Christians that are doing well, even when it's hard. And it sounds like Paul trying to comfort them in the midst of their pain. And we've all had those painful moments where somebody comforts you with words that aren't helpful. Paul is human too, and can comfort in ways that maybe, you know, that bad guy's really gonna get it someday. Thanks, Paul, but right now I'm still hurting. Right now that pain feels like a bonfire inside. Last week we had a, a, a graph on the screen that talked that had a diagram that said um, how righteous you feel and how um, how much hatred you have and how the more righteous we feel um, it increases our judgment and hatred for other people and as I was thinking about this passage in our game of comparisons um, I felt that you could replace those two words with uh, how busy we are and how bitter we can grow comparing ourselves to other people. Um, and how we can turn into those verses 5 through 10 of going, God, I'm suffering. Look at this person. They're doing nothing. And uh, can't you just get them to move and act? And our busyness can sometimes lead to bitterness. As I think about the comparison game, I, I want to ask, have you ever been so tired and stretched thin that you resent the schedule of others? I'm the only one in the room. Okay, this will go well. We're ready. <laughs> Am I the only one that feels that pressure, uh, even if it's justified, that everybody wants a bite of your time? Work, church, 
kids' sports, kids' education, your own education, relaxation, holidays, or other family functions, and then your community needs. All things can be good, but how do I divide up my 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, eat my vegetables, drink all the water I'm supposed to, and sleep a decent amount? Sometimes getting stretched thin can make us lose that focus of a faithful, loving community. It can be painful. I want you to stop for a minute and ask, are you tired? And I know we had like an extra hour of sleep, you know, last night, in theory. Or maybe you were like, yeah, I can work for an extra hour tonight. Like, or maybe you have kids and you didn't get to sleep an extra hour at all because they were up whenever they wanted to be. Are you tired? Lord, we're tired and it's hard to be faithful and loving when we feel underappreciated or overworked. If we look at the history of the church, busyness doesn't work for the gospel. And things have to change in ourselves and churches as a whole to prevent burnout and resentment and a quenching, quenching of the gospel message so that we don't become those people speaking those venomous words to others when we should be demonstrating that faithful love of the bigger picture of Paul's message. Wait a second, Pastor. Are you talking about change on All Saints Day where we are celebrating history and the legacy of people? Did you just stomp on somebody? <laughs> oh, I thought it was Josh. Was like, he reached into his pocket and I thought it was my fiance. I, I also that. thought it was me. <laughs> <laughs> about change <laughs> and change being attention that sometimes we feel when we look at our legacy when I look at the history of our people that we miss the church hasn't always done the same thing over time if we look at the Thessalonians who were hi hiding in church houses um, like people's houses and that's where they met and used like graffiti symbols to denote their um, church's location so like secret symbols secret locations to, to hide to like go and worship in private scared that they would be crucified if found and we have this permanent beautiful building that we can worship in and you all basically have assigned seats where you sit every Sunday like I know where you're going to sit if you're here. Like I, I see your patterns. You know, change has happened over the course of the history of the church. But when change happens, it doesn't mean that we don't care and respect the history that we come from. We're not spitting on the Thessalonians because we have a building. And there are moments when I look at how we schedule our lives and maybe we need to do something different. And it doesn't mean that my grandmother did church wrong or corrupt or bad. It just means, first off, I'm not a home ec major and don't have the skills my grandmother had. I cannot make noodles from scratch. I mean, maybe if that's what I did for a career, I could, but there are only so many hours in the day. Now, as we celebrate all saints and all souls, we want to thank them for their legacy. We think about these candles, and we think about the people represented by these candles, and the fact that we have a church today because of their legacy. Because of what they did for ministries. And we, we can take this moment to thank them for what they have done. And that we have a space here today because of them. 
whether it be, you know, um, my grandparents never worshipped here, but they are the reason I have a faith today. We thank them for what they have done for the church as a whole. And in this moment, we can also ask them a blessing. A blessing to say that as we saw them pour out their love and sweat into the church, that they bless us to find the appropriate ways to pour our love and sweat into the church and into the community, growing on what they taught us, rooted in Christ, but being aware that generations don't think the same way. I know that's news, no, maybe it's not news, you guys are smart people, we know this. We have multiple generations sitting here, whether it be teenagers or octa, Barb, how do you say that, octogenarian? Did I say that right? 80 year olds or teenagers, fancy word. I know it's a surprise, 80 year olds and teenagers aren't gonna think the same way, but we are all the church together and the legacy of the church is not if we do things exactly the same forever, but that we carry on the teachings and the story of Christ throughout those generations. I think about, uh, specifically with Liberty, before I came here a while ago, um, you guys did noodle dinners where people made the noodles from scratch, correct? But now, we buy this, the noodles from scratch from Morningstar, because that's a ministry they do, and not all of us can take the time to bake all those noodles for a noodle dinner. That doesn't mean that that change says that the ones who made the noodles from scratch did something wrong. We're grateful that they poured that time and effort into it, because oh my goodness, that is a long time to making that many noodles. Who of you have ever tried to make the noodles, even if it wasn't successful? Right, you know the effort that it takes, right? Does anybody, well, uh, we could go back to that easily to, for the sake of tradition, and some people may lead to more blood and tears than sweat to, to figure out how to do that and sleep. Um, but we also can celebrate that there's another church that makes them as their ministry, and we, doing our ministry, can support their ministry. And there's something about the legacy that keeps going. We still do our noodle dinners, we still have this legacy continuing on, but it just looks a little bit different, and we're still honoring that. Does that make sense? Ministry can still happen, even if something shifts a little bit. And we talked about being tired, and I think something sometimes has to give in ministry, so we don't lead to burnout. We don't lead to bitterness, and we're so tired that we're singing VBS songs through grumbles, you know? It's not really welcoming to kids if volunteers are grumbling while, you know, trying to hang out with them. Instead of clinging to some hopeless romantic pictures of the church, I'd like us to be open to possibilities, to be faithful, loving church members like we have been taught to be, built by generations, and preparing for the next little generation who struggle every week to light these candles, but are a joyful part of our worship, as we are part of that legacy. So I want to propose an idea that is not like me saying, everything gets scrapped. But I want to propose the idea of what if we count things that we haven't counted before and celebrate the ways you guys are pouring out your time in ways we haven't before. Um, as I was meeting with my PR team, Kira was wonderful enough to, to name this idea that I have, um, called calling it Hidden Ministries, the Hidden Ministries of Liberty. So if you look in your, um, by your pew, your hymnals, there's a little piece of paper in there. And what this is about is a changing of our mindset uh, 
to, instead of thinking we need to try harder to say, and we feel like the church has become a burden on us that also is pulling at our time, to say, our church is a loving church that I know is serving even when the, it's not on the church calendar. And they're giving even when the church set isn't, hasn't declared that the mission focus of the month. And I want us to hear about those stories of places you're giving of your time or giving of your resources. Not so we can go, woohoo, we're going to brag on Rosemary this month. Go, Rosemary. I mean, we need to brag on you anyway because you're great. But to say, look at how the church is moving. And you're serving and you're giving. It's okay if this time we don't do... Um, I can't think of a thing at the moment, but if we give up on something on our church calendar and we join Christy in doing the thing that's already on her calendar because that fits what we want to do for them this season. So I want you to take this a moment. You don't, if you need a time to think and you're not like a rapid fire talker like myself, you can take this with you or you can fill out on here uh, your name because if I have questions about, and want to know more about that thing, I'd like to know who to talk to. I promise I won't make this like giant list that we hang on the wall that says, says who's done what and like, we're not playing the judgy game here, we're playing an opportunity to dive deeper game. And so to, there's that space for how, to give my how I give my time and consider the ways you do things daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. And I say that because there's this like um, opportunity, I think it's at the mall every year where you can volunteer your time to wrap presents for some thing. Um, and that's not a yearly thing, but that, you know, or there are some things that are things you do all the time and there are some things that are just a seasonal thing. Think of how you give your time. And then the second half is think of how you give your resources. So things other than your time, if it's finances, um, your materials in your house, maybe your bedroom, like if somebody is staying with you, that is a resource you are sharing. Um, these are daily, weekly, monthly, yearly uh, things. And as we, and I was going to hold somebody to, to have an offering plate to pick up. We'll just give you a second to, um, so as you're filling these out, there will be somebody rather cute in a vest. Um, Walking up the up and down the aisle, available for you to toss your papers in, or you can shoot me a picture of it later this week. And we'll compile this list of the hidden ministries that the church, which is you, are doing to celebrate those things. Okay. <laughs> to celebrate those things in the church. And our hope is that this is our moment to be like Paul in the beginning and the end of the passage we read today where he says, I have to thank God for you, for what I see you doing. And we don't get to a place of, ah, my schedule is so busy and that person does nothing and I just want to put stuff on their plate because I'm busy. If we practice this looking for the hidden ministries and seeing what people are doing and having chances to celebrate those things, perhaps it will also perpetuate a faithful, loving space of joy in what is happening already in the church. And not feeling like the church is somebody saying, we're not doing enough, add more to your time. Um, if you have um, yours filled out and you are ready to pass them on, feel free to make them available and he'll pick those up. We'll have those in the pews for the next few weeks available if you have updates or new opportunities that you have been passionate about. I want to celebrate what you're doing. I want to be a pastor championing you, saying, go you guys for what you have been doing in this church uh, and outside of this church, whether it be that we made an organized uh, date, an, an event for a fish fry, or you guys went and served somewhere without somebody telling you to. We want to celebrate that. <laughs> Those will continue to be available for you over the next couple weeks. Um, if you have um, need some time to think, that's okay. 
um, and can bring those to me. And we'll make this amazing list of the hidden ministries here and change to a culture of, don't hear what I'm not saying in that, but that we pursue a culture of faith-filled love and joy, celebrating what's happening here and not playing the comparison game of bitterness towards each other. That we put that defense up for ourselves, preventing us from becoming those people. As we celebrate the hidden ministries in the church, we are grateful for the much more obvious ministries. Um, our, we're going to be doing communion in a few minutes, and um, the beautiful gift of the deacons is that we know who they are and we see that they serve. You don't see how much they serve or what they do, but um, they have this moment where they get to serve you and love you and show you that they are caring for this group of people too. It's not just me up here, but it's them too here to keep your eyes on you, to love you and encourage you in your walk. Um, so in these hidden ministries, invisible ministries, we will point back to Christ and say, he's why we do this. His blood and uh, body for us is why we do this. So I'd like to invite my deacons forward at this time. We're going to serve and we will prepare while they're getting ready, if you still have a paper, you can feel free to set that up and then we'll have the plate in the back at the end of the service too.
more like his sacrifice and love. Do this in remembrance of him. In the same way that we remember Christ through the body, we also remember him through his blood. And I'm going to ask Jay to pray a blessing for the cup first. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning to give thanks for what we have, we also realize the sacrifices were made, that the blood, of the, the blood of Jesus was spilled for us today so we may be pure, purified and clean. As we gather here today, we also give thanks that we have this abundance that we have and we have the ability to assemble. Let's not forget that through, all, through Jesus all things are possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.